Hello, ladies. Welcome to the Organize Your Joy podcast, where we celebrate everyday moms. Let's organize your space that fits your unique family. We can transform our homes, allowing us to create love and connection, parent with intention while nurturing our passions. I'm your host, Crystal Meldrum. This podcast is brought to you by OrganizeYourJoy.com. Let's get organized. Okay, so before we get into this week's topic, I just want to do a little follow-up. Last month, when we recorded the podcast, I invited you to write a letter to God and have him write a letter back to you because our theme was organize yourself, gaining your self-worth from God. And so this is a wonderful tool where you write a letter. It's like writing a prayer. Dear God, I'm struggling with this. I'm happy about this. Will you help me with this? And then he writes a letter back to you. It's actually you writing a letter, but you just kind of listen and you just kind of intuitively hear him. And as you write, it's just wonderful. You can really hear him talking to you. So it's an amazing tool. Just remember that if you're ever really discouraged, really at a loss and you don't know what to do, that is a tool you can use that can help you hear God's voice and remember where you get your self-worth from. Not from the negative voices, but from the best source, your biggest cheerleader you'll ever have, God, your Heavenly Father. Today's episode topic is creating an organized home in five habits. 90% of Americans, number one thing that they want is connection. And you might wonder, well, why is it important to have some organizing habits? How does that affect getting connection? Well, if your house is a disaster, if the clutter is piled as high as the ceiling, then you're going to feel possibly nervous about inviting friends over. Your kids might feel nervous about inviting friends over. You will feel more peace having order, and you can do it through having five simple steps. So every day you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have these five habits and whether it's a good day or bad day, you're like, I do my five habits and then it's a pretty great day because we got the basics done. You are the queen bee of your hive. And there's this phrase I love, maintain your hive with the fabulous five. So that's what I'm going to teach you is how to maintain your hive with your fabulous five. First, I want to praise a woman who does this amazing. I have a friend named Lindsay Scarber and she has 10 children. And when she had eight children, she and her husband were both working and they were just like, we need more income. We've got to do something different. And so the husband decided that he wanted to go back to school to become a lawyer. And so they talked about it and they decided to move to a different state. And they rented a little tiny basement apartment that was 900 square feet. The kitchen was like a little hallway and it had three bedrooms and they took their eight kids and put them all on triple bunk beds. But she had order. Her house, you could walk, you could see the floor. And it was amazing. I got to visit her and she said she would teach her kids to do their big five each day. She says, whether you homeschool or you're in public school, you always have to do these five things. So her big five that she taught her little children to do was one, make your bed, two, say your prayers, three, get dressed, four, tidy up the room, and five, brush your hair and teeth. And so I'm going to teach you a different set of fabulous five, the fabulous five for moms, but this is a fantastic fabulous five for kids. And with my children, I'd say, have you done your foundation? It was up, bed, dress, pray. Let's have a great day. And so instead of having every day, like, did you do this, 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 this? Go back. You got to brush your teeth. You know, it was just like, have you done your foundation? Have you done your fabulous five? A foundation for a house is really important because if a house is just all wood, going straight down into the dirt, water goes into the dirt, and then water will rot wood. So you have to put down a cement foundation or a stone foundation, and then you can put wood on the top of that. You can still have a lot of other things you do in your day besides your 
fabulous five. So you got to figure out what are your rocks? What are your bricks? What is most important to you as the mom, as the queen bee that you're like, this is something that I really know is important. This is something that needs to get done every day. So put it in your fabulous five. If it's that important, put it in your fabulous five. The fabulous five is number one, create a morning routine. Number two, use a planner and a calendar. Number three, implement a weekly deep cleaning system. Number four, clean the kitchen after every meal. And number five, tidy as you go. So if you had just these five habits, you'll feel like you have a little sense of control in your life. And it's a good feeling. <laughs> so we want to put as many decisions on autopilot because we experience decision fatigue and we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every day. Our minds need to be free to create connection and joy. And, you know, like I want my mind to be free to write books about mermaids and to paint paintings. I'm excited to tell you about this painting I have that I painted for this month's episode. But we want our mind to be free and not be thinking, that kid didn't brush his teeth. He's not going to have any friends because his breath stinks. We're going to get those basics done. And then we're going to move mountains. <laughs> so in the Organize Your Joy Workbook, the Mom's Complete Organizing Guide, which is available on Amazon, on page 50 through about 54, it talks about the Fabulous Five. So I'll be teaching you from that. With creating a morning routine, you need to remove the indecision and guilt and procrastination from your day. And you don't want to like wake up every day and say, today, do I feel like getting dressed to my makeup, to my shoes, or do I feel like staying in my pajamas all day? It's just like, no, we are going to make a decision. We're going to choose a time to wake up Monday through Friday. It's like, I'm going to wake up at six and even if I have to do it by having a buddy that I exercise with at six, I will find a way to get myself out of bed so that I can have a successful day. So Cassandra Arson, the clutter bug, she said she didn't like having the idea of having routines at first because she thought it would be boring and just mundane and monotonous. But she said the idea of having schedule and routines felt like conformity when reality it was really about maturity. The truth is organizing my time properly has opened up my life and given me much more time for the things I truly love. Great mornings equal great days. Isn't that great? I love that. So my morning routine is up, bed, dressed, pray, power hour, plan dinner. Up is I get up and I exercise first thing. In my life, I've had to rotate sometimes when I've exercised, when I was pregnant and I was getting fatigued too much from exercising early. But most of my life, I've exercised first in the morning because it's just fun to move your body. And if you're doing exercise just for weight loss, you probably won't experience success. Weight loss is really won by the food you eat. Exercise is awesome because it reduces stress. It makes you feel good. I exercise because I carry a lot of stress in my neck. And so when I exercise, it shakes everything all out and I feel good. And when I have less stress, I can make better choices in the kitchen. But if you're like, I'm going to exercise so I can lose 50 pounds. Well, it's really, it's the food you eat. If you eat really healthy and stay away from the white flour and the white sugar, you're probably going to have a good weight. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but that was an epiphany change for me. I didn't realize weight loss is really one in the kitchen and it's one with your fork. So exercise is super important and it's fun. You can get sunshine. You can have a friend. All the exercise that I do is very fun. So I walk with a friend some days. I go to Aqua Zumba some days and I do yoga and I love walking with my friend because I get to talk and vent and just, you know, tell all my worries and I'm getting exercise and fresh air. And I love Aqua Zumba because the music is so loud and you're dancing underwater, but like no one can see you because the water is under where your legs are moving. And so 
you're just having a party and you're doing it with all these other friends. And anyway, it's very fun. I relax in the water. Like when I want to get ideas for a new book, I float in the water. And as I float, the ideas come. I get ideas other places too, but in the water is a really fun place for me to get ideas. Anyway, and then I love yoga because once a week I stretch for an hour and things slow down and my mind can catch up with my body. And it's just so awesome. So, you know, hiking is fun. There's a lot of fun things you can do. Sunshine is important. Fresh air is important. Try to figure out how to get sunshine and fresh air in your life. I go on little five minute walks with my boys and with my employees. When they come, we just walk around the block and we talk about what our plans are and then, and then we go to work. And so I get all these little walks during the day. So try to figure out how to get some fresh air and some sunshine into your life. Okay. So then my second thing I do is bed. I make my bed. And when you have made your bed, you have made the first great choice of tidying up one thing in your house. And it's very big. Beds can take up one third of the room. And so by making your bed, even like I take naps all the time, but I make the bed again. You make your bed and it sends a message. I'm a clean person. I live in a clean house. It's just amazing. So then the third thing is get dressed from your hair to your shoes, including your makeup. I want to give you the queen bee dress up challenge that you dress like that and you will get more done. I feel so much better about myself when I get dressed. And so I just get dressed nice every day. And I've been a stay at home mom like my whole life, even as a divorced person, I'm still a stay at home mom. And so I get dressed and it makes me feel better. And then I treat people better because I feel better about myself. So I would encourage you to do that. If you just wear sweats, you're not gonna get as much done. It's not gonna be comfy and cozy. You're gonna feel icky and like, oh, life just isn't as great. But the more casual you dress, in my opinion, the less you'll get done. And I love getting stuff done. So I dress up. And then pray. I combine prayer with scriptures. So I say my morning prayer. And then I read scriptures and I write in a scripture journal. And one of the secrets to having a great scripture journal experience is read the scriptures at the same time, same place. So it's like every day I read my scriptures and say my prayers in this little, I have a little sewing desk that doesn't have a sewing machine on it in my bedroom. And so I don't have to figure out where are my scriptures? Is it here, 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 here? You know, I just have it that one place. But I remember seeing my sister-in-law and I was so inspired by her because I was visiting her one time and her house wasn't perfectly clean and there were kids running around. She had company, like we were visiting from out of town and she just sat down and she just read her scriptures. And I was just so inspired by her because she didn't wait till everything was done. She just, she knew that was a high priority in her life. And so she just did it and she didn't have to have a pencil and a paper, you know, she just showed God what was important. And she put that as a high priority in her day. Then after pray power hour and then plan dinner power hour is you need to do something for you that makes you feel fulfilled. So it's some self care for me during the baby years, I would write in a journal for 15 minutes and everything that I did would have to be restarted the next day. There would need to be three more meals made. Diapers would need to be changed. Laundry would need to be washed again. The house I worked so hard to clean with all these little kids would be a disaster again the next day. And so writing in a little journal was the thing that just saved me because every day there was some jewel in the day, something beautiful, something wonderful. And I wrote it down. I had a love journal for my marriage. Then I had a journal on each of my children. And then I had my personal journal and I didn't know at the time that I was an author, but it turns out I like to write books too. But I love having a little journal because a baby book 
like where you write down when their 10th tooth came in. It's like, you don't need to know all those little details. But a journal with just lines in it, it's just so nice because you can just write in it and you've got all these memories and they're logged away as your precious treasures. So I have a daughter and five boys and my oldest boy served a mission in Argentina for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when he had two months left on his mission, the mission president called me and he said, your son is, something's the matter with him. We're not sure what it is, but we need to send him home. It turned out that he had cancer. He had a growth, a giant growth in his lung that was stage four cancer, rhabdomyosarcoma. This was just so devastating. This happened last year. And the doctors, we went to the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City. And the doctors said, we have bad news for you. We are going to be here for you. But your son has a 0% chance for survival. And he will probably live 8 to 24 months. And we, I was just devastated. He was devastated. We were all just devastated. So I stayed up at the hospital with him quite a bit and he didn't really want to talk very much because he was so shocked and sad. And so I did all the research I could about cancer. And then I was like, now what do I do? I had all this time on my hands. I would help my boy with what I could. And then I decided, you know what? I have his love journal. And I can type this up and give this to him. And I can remember all these sweet memories. This just saved me. So it saved me back in the baby years when I was kind of struggling with the monotony of life. And I wrote down my treasures, my jewels. And then it saved me again when my son was in the hospital. So I'm going to share just a few little memories. Hiram loves water. He has jumped in the bathtub five times with his clothes on after I had just given him a bath and the water was draining. I cannot remember that story. That's the beauty of writing things down, writing down these sweet moments that happen with your children. Here's another one. So this happened when he was three years old. <laughs> Man, I was holding Hiram in my bed on a Sunday morning and I said, Hiram, I don't know if I know how to raise boys. Is there anything I need to know or do to raise you? He said, just feed me. I asked, is there anything else? He answered, uh-uh. If only life were that simple. Hopefully if I feed him physically and spiritually and prepare him by teaching him everything I can, he will be prepared to go into the world someday. And then here was another sweet memory. This was when Hiram was eight years old. Twice when I've gone to the elementary school, I have been so pleased because when Hiram and Ben saw each other, they ran to each other and embraced. I hope they will always love each other and show the power of brotherhood to the world. That was one of my sweetest memories to see my boys hug in public and that they weren't ashamed or embarrassed and they just they loved each other. So that is what I did to fill my bucket. That was my power hour, was writing for 15 minutes. And then the last thing in my morning routine is plan dinner. So Julie Beck, she spoke at a fireside once and she said, you need to know what you're having for dinner by lunchtime. And that is so true because if you wait till four or five, it's like this panic. Oh no, what are we gonna have? Ah! you know but if you're just like in the morning it's part of your morning routine you're like what are we gonna have for dinner then it's just awesome because you can pull out the hamburger to thaw you have something that's just ready and thinking it up is probably the hardest part that's why you make the plan you can either make a menu plan that lasts for the whole week or each day one thing that i absolutely love is in the Organize Your Joy workbook, The Mom's Complete Organizing Guide. On page 57, there's a great little sheet, the Queen Bee Weekly Planner. And in it, it has on the middle a uh, dinner menu. So it has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And really, a lot of times, you only have to make three meals a week because you can have leftovers, unless you have picky people. Then 
it's sad for you. No, you can have grilled ham and cheese sandwiches, I guess. But, but anyway, it's really nice to have a dinner menu a week at a time figured out. So that is step one in your fabulous five is to have a morning routine. So step two is use a planner and a calendar. So you can either go digital or paper or both. And I use both. What I do is I have this awesome piece of paper. I have this on the fridge. And so I'll go over each little box. There's urgent to do. Each day is worth at least one post-it note. So what I do is I put a post-it note here with three things. The, these are the top two crisis burning urgent fires that need to get done. Then there's weekly to-dos under it, a box with 10, you could put a little list in pencil, just of things that you might want to get done that week. This paper usually lasts me for a month, and then I start with a fresh one. Then under that is honeydews. So honeydews, lists of things that you could work on on Saturday that are like, oh, this is broken, this is broken, this is broken, and I'm going to make some boy or some man feel real manly telling him how awesome he is when he fixes this for me. Okay, so then we've got in the middle the dinner menu, then correspondence. This is stuff that you might want to do emails, things like that, letters to send, thank yous. You just write yourself a little note. And so say you have a birthday card and a thank you, and you write them at the same time. And then under that is computer. So if there's some computer work that you need to do, like what we're doing is we're mega batching. Instead of getting all these different activities, we're putting the shopping list with the shopping list, phone calls with phone calls, errands with errands. So when you run your errands, you're not just running one errand, you're running all of your errands. You're batching things so that you get things done. Then this bottom middle is the money tally. So that's like if you have a child that borrowed money and they owe you, you could write it down there because you just cannot remember everything. That's the main thing to remember. The queen bee cannot remember everything. So you have to write things down and put things down on paper and put it in our planner. So I have a calendar that I hang up and I write things on the calendar. The annoying thing and the blessing is you have these phones that travel with you. And so I put my stuff in the calendar on the phone and on the wall. But it's annoying because you have to do it twice, but it's very helpful because you can just look at a glance and when you're out and about, you can look on your calendar and say, oh, I've got something. Oh, he's got something. So my very favorite app for a to-do list is Google Keep. That is an amazing app. I have one for business and I have one for home, but they're just right under the same app. And this is free, which is so cool. So anyway, you need to write things down. And then the third thing is to choose and implement a weekly deep cleaning system. I'm going to talk about a few deep cleaning systems. These are in the book on page 51. There's a room zone system. So that's where every person in the family has their two rooms they're in charge of. And so when you say, hey, everybody go do their room zone, then they run in and they go pick up the, that room zone and they learn how to clean that room. You got to throw the shoes over here, or hang the coats up here and put the toys in this bin. And so they can get really good at it and you can get the house cleaned really quick and everybody has their part. There's this concept called family stewardships, which is not so much about cleaning. Actually, this is kind of a tangent, but I'm just throwing it in where each person has different jobs. Like someone's the cooker, someone's in charge of emergency preparedness, someone's in charge of vacation planning, and it gives people ownership in the family. And so it's kind of like the room zone system, but you can make it bigger with activities and things like that. Then the next one is the day of the week system. And I love this one. I'm going to talk about this in another podcast, but it's where each day you have a different focus. So Monday is laundry. Tuesday is mopping and cleaning the bathrooms. Wednesday is papers and office. So instead of each day waking up and thinking, do I feel like doing the laundry or are we in crisis? It's like, it's Monday, time to gather the laundry and wash some loads. So it's just an awesome system. Then another idea is daily jobs on a dry erase board. So that's where you just kind of look at your house and you're like, whoa, 
that room is a disaster and I only got two kids, so I'm going to assign it to the kid and then this other job needs to be done and I'll assign it to the other kid. So that's a great way to do it, but you do have to be involved. You have to write something down every day. And if you don't write something down, the kids might come home from school and they're like, there weren't any jobs, so I didn't do a thing. So the dry erase board is awesome. I use that for a lot of years too. The last one is hire help. Just because you have a house doesn't mean you need to clean the whole thing. When I had three kids, I was kind of drowning in overwhelm and discouragement. And so I had this little girl come over and she babysat my kids and cleaned the house. And when she left, I was just like, wow, that was amazing. She babysat and the house is clean. And my mom said, do not let that girl out of your life. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I paid her. I only paid her in the beginning, $5 an hour. And she came to my house for five years. And I just kept raising her wage because I didn't want to lose her. And she helped me so that I could take off this guilt about worrying about when am I going to clean those bathrooms? So you can hire teenage help or adult help. For me, I just love having buddies. I love connection. And so for me, I have a friend that comes over once a week. And so it's like, this is the best. If she was there, I had motivation to clean. So we would get two or three bathrooms cleaned, the laundry folded and put away, the floors mopped and clean the fridge. So the fourth thing is clean the kitchen after every meal. This can change your life overnight. When I went to college, I had a roommate. She would always do this. She was like, we can't go to bed until this kitchen's clean. And I was like, yeah, I can. I totally can. And I didn't learn that lesson from her. Then as a married woman, I finally learned this. When you clean your kitchen every night, it's amazing because when you wake up the next day, it's like, I'd always think, what's happening? Is it Christmas? Is a company coming over? Oh, no, it's just, I clean the kitchen because important people are coming to my breakfast table and it's my family. <laughs> so if you wonder what is the most important meal to clean up after, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, what do you think it is? It is dinner. Dinner is the most important because you wake up with a fresh day and you don't have yesterday's problems staring you in the sink, in the face. So my sister-in-law, she's having her eighth baby and what she does, she just cleans after dinner. She has simplified her life so much. So she uses these wax restaurant papers that you can get for half a cent each. And she'll put that on a plate and then she just cleans the dishes off by throwing away the restaurant wax papers and then putting the dishes by the sink and then they just clean, load the dishwasher at night and they only clean the kitchen once a day. And she's brilliant. And so just remember, clean the kitchen after every meal, but definitely after dinner. The last most important thing is tidy as you go. If you get something out, you put it away. If you come home, you hang up your purse, you put your keys in the same place every time. You need to train your children and your husband to tidy as they go. Everything you do is a circle that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so what happens is most people go around this circle and they stop on the nine. So say it's a clock. They go one, two, three, four, five, six, get to the 9 p.m. and they quit. But we don't quit. We are finishers. We are going to take it to midnight and we are going to finish each circle. So we are completing tasks and then going on to new tasks and completing a task. It is just awesome. When you tidy as you go, it's like you have this magical tidy fairy that follows you and somehow your house is clean because things are getting put away. I would like to challenge you to create your own fabulous five habits and use the inspiration that you've received. So you create your own fabulous five. I want to talk about spiritual connection, like in a larger context, we need a foundation for our life. This painting I did, it's called establish a house. And this house has a foundation. The painting, it's a house in the middle of a stormy ocean resting on a tiny rocky island surrounded by ominous clouds. Big waves are pelting the rocks 
and there's an arched doorway at the bottom of the island. We all need an anchor. We need a foundation. Just like you need a foundation for your day, you need a foundation for your life. We're going to talk later about what are your big rocks, and you want to put in your big rocks first. But this painting, I think, really shows the idea of the importance of a foundation. If this house had sand underneath it, it would just wash away very quickly. It's a very small island. It reminds me of that scripture, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. One of the foundation blocks in my life was my husband and I chose for me to be a stay-at-home mom. And that was hard for me because I'm a social butterfly and I love to be on stage. I love to be in the spotlight. And being home alone with the little children was very quiet and you're just feeding them and helping them take naps and and you're just like, oh man, can you guys grow up so we can do something fun and exciting? And it, it's a kind of a slow process. One of my mentors, James E. Faust, he's an apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He gave a great quote and he said, my dear granddaughters, you cannot do everything well at the same time. You cannot be a hundred percent wife, a hundred percent mother, a hundred percent church worker, a hundred percent career person, and a hundred percent public service person at the same time. How can all these roles be coordinated? Says Sarah Davidson, the only answer I come up with is that you can have it sequentially. At one stage, you may emphasize career, and at another, marriage and nurturing young children. And at any point, you will be aware of what is missing. If you are lucky, you will be able to fit everything in. Doing things sequentially, filling roles one at a time at different times is not always possible as we know, but it gives a woman the opportunity to do each thing well in its time and to fill a variety of roles in her life. A woman does not necessarily have to track a career like a man does. She may fit more than one career into the various seasons of life. She need not try to sing all the verses of her song at the same time. The book of Ecclesiastes says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Ecclesiastes 3.1 The various roles of women have not decreased a woman's responsibility. While these roles are challenging, the central roles of wife and mother remain in the soul and cry out to be satisfied. It is in the soul to want to love and be loved by a good man and to be able to respond to the God-given deepest feelings of womanhood, those of being a wife and nurturer. This is from the Enzyme 1986. C.S. Lewis said, the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist to support the ultimate career. I believe this with all my heart. Even though motherhood can feel mundane, long, physically demanding, Mentally taxing, emotionally exhausting, not super exciting, and plain boring sometimes. I know that what I do as a mother matters more than anything, and I am truly changing the world as I build my family. So I encourage you as well to figure out how you're going to prioritize your motherhood. And this is a thing that there's a lot of guilt attached, and we all do our best, but I'm just so grateful that. I've been able to be a stay-at-home mom, and I'm now working a lot more on my career as an artist and writer, and I get to still do it at home. So I want to tell you a story that kind of illustrates one more aspect of this painting, those ominous clouds. My sister and her children, and my, me and my children and my parents, we went to visit Nauvoo, Illinois, and on our way back, 
my mom had been receiving tornado warnings on her phone all day, but she didn't think of telling us. And the sky had been absolutely majestic. The clouds were the biggest clouds I had ever seen. They were just glorious. And the sky was the most brilliant blue I had ever seen. And so we had about 45 minutes left on our trip and it started to rain. And so we thought, well, we're going to go get some gas and then we're just going to drive 45 more minutes and we'll, then we'll be to our destination. And so as we got on the freeway, it looked like we were driving towards a giant wall of black clouds. And we live in Utah. So in Utah, when it rains, it's fine. And nothing bad happens. I mean, usually it's just the rain stops because we live in a desert. Well, this wall of black clouds was actually a tornado. We couldn't see the tornado, but the tornado was passing through. And all of a sudden, all the cars on the freeway stopped. And ping pong size hell started hitting our car. And it made the loudest sound. And it was so scary. And it was just pelting us, pelting us. And people in the car, we were in two cars, a truck pulling a camper trailer, and then my van. And the sound was so loud. People were screaming. And one of the little children that was sitting by me, he said, Crystal, can I play on your phone right now? And I said, no. Please. I was silently praying. And this child, he thought maybe what I should do is distract myself because I'm really, really scared. Crises are wonderful teaching opportunities. And that was a wonderful teaching opportunity to tell that child, when there's a crisis, you should pray. You don't just distract yourself endlessly. Pray. So my van got 10 spiderweb cracks all over the windshield. We could barely see to drive. My sister had recently gotten in a terrible car accident and had broken her neck. She was in that front seat and she was so scared because we thought the glass was going to break. And then those ping pong hell were going to hit her. So she transferred seats with her son. We put up a blanket in case the glass shattered. 10 windows shattered in my dad's camper trailer, but my windshield held. We decided to go back to the city we came from and we stayed at a hotel and we were very blessed because the tornado did not pick us up and throw us out like we were little toy cars. It was quite an experience, but it really illustrates a scripture that I want to share that's kind of like this painting. This scripture is in the Book of Mormon. It's Helaman chapter 5, verse 12. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation, that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hell and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. I wanted to finish telling you a little bit about my son, Hiram. It's been a year and we had a miracle. He got married. His high school sweetheart and him got married. And the doctors gave him eight to 24 months to live. And he's lived about 14 months. And we might not get the big miracle, but we have gotten so many miracles. My son feels good. He's happy, especially because when he left on his mission is when my divorce happened. And so there's been a lot of miracles that have happened, even though we've had these hard things. But no matter what happens, we are built upon the rock of Christ. And my boy is a good man. And I'm just so proud of him. And I'm proud of his wife. They are anchored to Christ. And so whatever happens, everything's going to be okay. I want to read you one little story. This is one of my favorite books. It's called The Artist by John Bianchi. And for many years when I wasn't painting, 
I just read the story and I just felt like this story gave me hope and helped me feel like I might not paint, but I'm doing the most important work that I could do. The artist that wrote and illustrated it, he had met a graphic designer who had big dreams of things that he wanted to do and paint and create but he passed away young and he didn't get to do that. And so it inspired him to write this book. And Frank B. Edwards that works with Bungalow Books gave me permission to read this on my podcast. Even when he was very young, Emilio loved to paint. Though his paint box was small, his imagination was immense. And he would often work for hours painting remarkable pictures while dreaming of a life as a great artist. When he grew older, Emilio loved to go to the park to study the famous artists of the day. He would often make notes and drawings in a small sketchbook that was with him wherever he went. Sometimes he would visit Henry Maltese, known for his legendary experiments with color. Wow! Oftentimes, he would stop for a chat with Dame Emily von Brezoit, whose powerful landscapes were filled with magnificent light. And he would never miss a chance to watch Camille Briard, whose use of a radical composition had turned the art world upside down. Amelia could not wait to grow up and follow in the footsteps of his heroes. Someday, he too would be a painter of great landscapes. I could do that. Great colors. But luck was not with Emilio. Times turned tough and each member of the family had to help out. And what will you do? Asked Emilio's mother. I will paint faces in the little park by the Gargonzola Bridge, said Emilio. And that is exactly what he did. In fact, he became well known for the glorious rainbows he would paint on the cheeks of his young customers. But this left no time for painting great landscapes. When he was older, Emilio decided to attend art school. And how will you pay for your education? Asked Emilio's father. I will sketch portraits of the ladies and gentlemen in the town square, replied Emilio. And that is exactly what he did. While he was in art school, Emilio fell in love with the beautiful lemon jello. Will you marry me? Asked Emilio one day while they were dancing at the cafe. Of course, replied Lemon Jello. And how will you two support yourselves? Asked their parents when they had been told the news. I will create fashion designs for all the famous dress salons, said Lemon Jello. And I will make posters for the town's opera house, replied Emilio. Emilio and Lemon Jello hoped to have a large family. And when the little ones arrived, Emilio took an extra job working nights at the Provolone Sign Company. Now the painting of great landscapes was nothing more than a distant memory that would sometimes visit Emilio while he was inscribing an especially ornate letter on one of his signs. Or changing a diaper on one of his puppies. Whenever the town needed an artist, Emilio was always there. He designed packages for the Presto Pasta Company, fashioned greeting cards for the Mamma Mia stationery store, and sketched courtroom scenes for the town newspaper. He even helped a local architect design affordable houses. And so went the artist's life, happily distracted by the joys of his family and his work. Emilio had no chance to create great landscapes. Only in his later years did Emilio finally find time to paint. On sunny days, he would visit the park to work on his landscapes, but would usually end up entertaining his many grand pups. One day when he was quite old, Emilio fell gravely ill a doctor was summoned and his family gathered around him. All knew that Emilio was not long for this world. Some started to cry. Please, said Emilio, do not cry for me. I have had a good long life and have been able to watch you all grow up. I only wish I had more time to spend with the beautiful lemon jello and maybe a few more moments to paint pictures of this wonderful land. The old artist died that night and was immediately escorted to heaven by an angel. After a hot bath and a chocolate cappuccino, Emilio was given a new robe, a fresh set of wings, and a halo. Then he was brought before God. My staff and I have watched your life with much interest, said God. And since you have led an honest and kindly life, and have always cared for your family, 
we have decided to grant you a permanent place in heaven. Now the first thing you'll need is a job. We like to keep our new angels as busy as possible. Let's see. God started reading through his job file. We have openings for a face painter, must have previous experience, a portrait artist, please show samples of recent work, and a sign painter, must be able to spell big words. You may have your choice of any of these fine heavenly occupations. Thank you, God, said Emilio. I am most honored. But would you have an opening for a landscape artist? Let me look again, said God. Well, there is nothing like that available at this time. But why don't I create a job for you in the glorious sunrise department? Would you like that? I would love it, said Emilio. Then you shall have it, said God. But before you start, would you paint one of your famous rainbows on my face? Of course, replied Emilio. And so after a lifetime of hard work, Emilio was at last able to create great landscapes. And one morning, if you are up early enough, you may have the good fortune to see some of his fine work. Was that a great book? That was amazing. I love that story. I wanted this story read at my funeral, just in case I never did get any paintings out. But it turns out I've lived long enough that I am actually getting some paintings done. So the key takeaways from this episode is maintain the hive with the fabulous five. You are the queen bee. And so you need to create five important things, five important habits. And the call to action this month is to write these down. Number one is create a meaningful morning routine. And one other tip on that is you might want to think about what's something I want to do every day for me mentally, spiritually, physically, or your house, something you want to do for your house each day, something for your husband each day, your kids each day, just whatever is like that most important thing. If you can somehow get the ball rolling towards whatever that priority is, it's like dinner is really important. That serves me and all my children by putting that as part of my morning routine of figuring out what are we eating tonight. Anyway, so number two, use a planner and a calendar, digital, paper, or both, but you need to write things down. You cannot remember everything and you shouldn't try. You need to dump things out on paper and then know where to find it or dump them into your phone and know where to find it. Then number three, implement a weekly deep cleaning system. And number four, clean the kitchen after every meal. The most important meal is dinner. Always clean up after dinner. And, and number five, tidy as you go. Remember everything is a circle and people are tempted to quit at the nine o'clock, but we don't quit at nine o'clock. We go to the midnight or we even do a little extra. So we're blessing ourselves all the time. Just a little, little blessing of finishing and then a little bit more. So that is the wrap up. I am super excited for you to do your fabulous five. I'd like to encourage you to do it the whole month of March and then share with a buddy and see if you can get a buddy to also do the fabulous five. And then you keep each other going because we need support. Everybody is struggling. Everybody's lonely. Madeline L. Engel, the lady who wrote A Wrinkle in Time, she had a locket that she wore. And inside the locket, it said, everyone is lonely. We're all lonely and we need each other. We need buddies. So get a buddy and say, I want to maintain my hive with a fabulous five. What's your fabulous five? And you guys keep each other going because you need a cheerleader. You need someone to help you keep on going. We can do this. Yes, we can. So thank you for joining me on the Organize Your Joy podcast. You are the heart of your home. You are not alone and you are making a difference. I hope you are inspired to do something joyful today. Let's organize our joy.